In this video, we're going to talk about comparing proportions specifically between two groups. So we'll start by recollecting the definition of the standard error. We'll then move on to um, like a setup. I'll set up a scenario for you where um, comparing proportions between two groups would be informative and hopefully the example is somewhat tangible. And then I'll specify uh, more generally how to test, that is like create a hypothesis test that compares two proportions. And then we're going to talk about a confidence interval of the difference of two proportions. And it might not be immediately clear why we're doing a confidence interval of the difference of two proportions, but hopefully by discussing the test between two proportions first, it'll be a little bit more clear. And then as seems to be the case in almost all my videos these days, we'll conclude with an example in R. So let's just dive in. Recall the standard error for the single mean has, single sample mean has this definition. It is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. When you put uh, the square root of the sample size in the denominator, you are essentially saying as your sample size goes up, the standard error will go down. Now use this as a quick example as we've done before. The fraction 1 half is bigger than the fraction 1 over 200. Because 200 is bigger than 2, the fraction 1 over 200 will be smaller than 1 half. Now the same idea holds here. If your sample size goes up, if that capital N in the denominator gets bigger, then your standard error will go down. The intuition I want you to have about a standard error is as your sample size goes up, the uncertainty associated with your guess of a sample mean will go down. As your sample size goes up, the uncertainty in your sample mean goes down. As you collect more and more data, your uncertainty goes down. Because you have more data, you know more things about the population. It's that intuition I want you to maintain about the standard error throughout the rest of and hopefully beyond this class. Because that intuition is going to stick with us through each next model in the class. Even if the calculations for the standard error get more complex, which they will, that intuition will remain. As your sample size goes up, uncertainty will go down. So let's say we've done that one, at least as far as intuition is concerned. Next, let's set up a quick scenario about comparing proportions between two groups. So I'll just start us on a new page. And let's say you're interested in comparing Um, nah, let's start differently than comparing. Identifying, let's say you're interested in identifying spam emails. That is, you want to know if the next email you receive is something you actually want, or if it's something where the sender is trying to trick you into giving away your credit card number. You don't want the spam emails where somebody is trying to trick you into giving away your credit card number. One way people will do this is by claiming you won something. You won this huge prize. The only way to collect this huge prize is by giving me your credit card number so I can put the huge prize on your credit card balance sheet or something like this. Or maybe the only way to give you this huge prize is giving me your social security number. Either way, you won big money. So one way people have attempted to identify spam emails is by asking the question, does the email contain the word winner? If you won something big, you are a winner. So what we're going to do then is try to identify spam emails by asking, 
does the email contain the word winner? And the way we'll go about tackling this is theorizing that there's two population proportions out there. We'll call the first population proportion P underscore one. And we're going to define the first population proportion to be of all the emails that do not contain the word winner, uh, whoops, start phrasing it as a question, it's not a question. Of all the emails that do not contain the word winner, P1 is the proportion that are spam. And we'll compare that to a second proportion of all the emails that do contain the word spam, uh, contain the word winner, sorry. P2 is the proportion that are spam. So P1 and P2 are proportions of emails that contain spam. They differ based on whether or not they contain the word winner. P1 is a proportion of emails that are spam that do contain the word winner. And P that do not contain the word winner. And P2 is a proportion of emails that are spam that do contain the word winner. What we want to know is if these two proportions are the same. We essentially want to come up with a statistical test that asks if P1 is equal to P2. And in fact, that's exactly what hypothesis testing to proportions does for us. So in the world of hypothesis testing of two proportions, we inherently want to set up the null hypothesis that the true population probability of emails that are spam and do not contain the word winner is equal to the true population proportion of emails that are spam and do contain the word winner. We'll contrast that with an alternative hypothesis about the same population parameters, but with the alternative of not equals to. And following standard scientific practice, we will specify our level of significance first. But here's the trick people have done in order to evaluate this hypothesis test. They've realized that the different, that P1 equals to P2 is equivalent mathematically to the difference between the two population parameters being equals to zero. So the way they formulate this test statistic is by saying, let's start with our best guess of the difference of the population parameters of interest. And then we can subtract off the value in the null hypothesis, which based on our rewriting is zero, and we'll divide by the standard error. Now, here's the trick. For this new hypothesis test, for this new um, summary statistic, the difference between these two pop, uh, sample proportions, the standard error in the denominator of this test statistic is quite a bit more complex than the standard error we just discussed. So this standard error is different, um, let's be more specific, different than before, since we now have two sample means and are interested in the difference.
because of these complications that we now have two sample means and we are interested in the difference of these two sample means, this standard error is no longer as simple as take the single sample standard deviation and divide by the square root of the sample size. All of those component pieces show up in the standard error for the difference of two proportions, but the calculation itself is more difficult. And in fact, we're just going to let R do this calculation for us. So that's going to be my uh, setup for testing two proportions. This is inherently the hypothesis that we use for comparing two proportions. We get a test statistic out that looks something like this, but in the end, we'll let R do most of the heavy lifting for us, and we will just focus on here's the p-value we got, how can we use the p-value to conclude the hypothesis test that I boxed? Okay, so let's just do one more general example before we move into R. We're going to look at next confidence intervals for difference of two proportions. And really, this is just going to build off the way we phrased the hypothesis test. We phrased the hypothesis test in terms of the difference of two proportions so that we could look at one uh, test statistic. And in fact, confidence intervals are going to start with that same quantity of interest, the difference between the sample proportions. And then we're going to add and subtract some number of standard errors, where again, this standard error is more complicated than for a single mean. So I'm just going to let us skip the calculation of the standard error. We will let R do that calculation for us. But we should say something about um, confidence intervals nonetheless. So here's what I'm going to say. What you're to imagine for a confidence interval about the difference of two proportions is imagine that you're looking at a number line. And my number line only needs to go down to negative 1 and only up to positive 1. If you get a confidence interval that looks like this, now notice it's above negative 1 and below 0. If you get a confidence interval where both the lower and upper bounds are negative, then that's evidence that p hat, you know what, that p2 is greater than p1. If you get both ends of a confidence interval to be negative, then that's telling you that from the data, P2 is so much bigger than P1 that we can basically conclude that P2, the true population proportion, is bigger than P1. On the other side of things, if you get a confidence interval where both the upper and lower bound are strictly positive, then we have evidence that P1 is greater than P2. And that just falls out from this difference once again. If both um, bounds of the confidence interval are positive, then P hat 1 was bigger than P hat 2 by more than this extra bit. And in that case, 
we have evidence that the proportion of the first group is greater than the proportion of the second group. Okay, those were the relatively easy scenarios. There's one last scenario that comes up. And it looks something like this. A scenario that happens sometimes is you get a confidence interval that contains zero. If your confidence interval contains zero, then P1 is approximately, then P hat one is approximately equal to P hat two, or at least within estimation error. That is the only way you could possibly separate out the difference between P1 and P2 if your current confidence interval contains zero is to get a bigger sample size. You would need to estimate P1 and P2 much more uh, accurately that is, your sample size would have to go up, so your uncertainty goes down. You'd have to estimate P1 and P2 much more accurately in order to move this confidence interval either left or right. But as it stands with your current sample size, if you have zero in the confidence interval, then we can't tell if P1 is any different than P2. We've set up a scenario where we can at least get some understanding about comparing proportions between groups. We've talked about, in general, testing two proportions, and we've talked about, in general, a confidence interval for two proportions. What I think is crucial to do next is go through an example. So we'll jump into R and do that next. So here we are in R, and we're going to see if we can work with um, a data set again, from my GitHub repository named data. We're going to work with a data set about emails, as we were alluding to in the examples previously. So the email.txt file is a help file telling us that we have a data set about emails of consisting of 300, wait, 3,921 observations and 21 variables. That is 21 columns. So the two variables we're going to be interested in are spam, an indicator that is a variable consisting of ones and zeros. It indicates with a one whether or not the email was spam. So this variable is going to identify spam for us. And here we go. Winner is an indicator variable that indicates whether or not winner appeared in the email. So this is just continuing with that example we did before. We're going to actually put some data to the examples. So we're going to use these two variables. We're going to use winner as like a grouping variable, as like a categorical variable, essentially, yes or no. And then we're going to treat spam as ones and zeros in order to calculate a proportion. So it's a little bit of a trick here with the way we're dealing with these um, indicator variables but it should work out to give us a reasonable analysis to determine whether or not emails are spam dependent on whether or not the email contains the word winner. So the usage here isn't terribly helpful. I guess I haven't updated all of these like I said I would or, or should have. So instead, I'm going to go back to the uh, initial repository. I'm going to click on the whoops, email CSV file. I'm gonna, oh, and then I'm going to wait for my internet to be slow because, you know, sometimes that's how the internet works. And then over here on the right side of the screen, I'm going to click raw. This is the raw URL, uh, the raw CSV file from which I can get the URL. So I will highlight all of it in Command-C on a Mac or Control-C on a Windows machine. Then over here, I will create a variable. Over here back in R, I'll create a variable named email because that seems logical. I'll use the function read.csv to read from the URL specified from that data set. And there it is. You can see the data frame read in with 3,921 emails 
and 21 variables. So just as a quick reminder, we're going to be interested in the variable spam and winner. But to use this data set, I'm going to encourage us that we're going to want to make a plot. I haven't actually showed us my preferred method for plots for proportions yet. And we're going to use the library dplyr. So we'll load both of those libraries. And let's start by making a plot. So we're going to use ggplot, the function, which takes a data frame as its first argument. And then we'll specify axes. And here's what I'm going to want us to do. I'm going to put winner on the x-axis and spam on the y-axis. Then I'm going to jump to this new layer that is stat summary. And I'm going to type out fun.data equals mean underscore cl normal, underscore normal, and then run that. It's a fairly large data set, so it might take some time on your machine. And this, I'm going to argue, is a much more informative plot than what you all might have seen previously in your experience with, with statistics and proportions. I'm going to guess a lot of you have seen bar charts with proportions, and I highly discourage bar charts with proportions. They are not the most reasonable transformation, the most reasonable vehicle to transfer information about a variable of proportions. So uh, before I go about explaining this plot in particular, you all might get an error message. It really kind of depends on your machine and the way things have installed previously. You might get an error message by running this code. If you do, I'm pretty sure the solution is to go to Packages, click Install, and then type out HMISS, M-I-S-C. So capital H, lowercase M-I-S-C. The M-I-S-C stands for miscellaneous. And the H is actually for the guy who's, who wrote the name, Frank Harrell, Harrell Miscellaneous. Uh, it turns out to be an incredibly useful package. Uh, so just install that package and then rerun this code. And I'm going to bet that fixes the error message for the vast majority of you. Uh, for everyone else, if you didn't see an error message, an error message and this plot just pops up immediately, that's fantastic. So here we go. Interpreting this plot on the x-axis is uh, the indicator variable winner. So no here is a essentially a column of all of the emails that do not contain the word winner. So here, this is going to be a proportion of the emails that are spam at something less than 10%, where the emails do not contain the word winner. So this is our P1 from our notes earlier. This, I don't know, it looks like 0.9. And over here in the yes column, this is all the emails that contain the word winner, that do contain the word winner. And then the proportion of the emails that contain the word win winner, which are spam. So we can see more than 30% of the emails that contain winner are spam, but less than 10% of the emails that do not contain the word winner are not are spam. So that's a huge difference between these two things. It indicates, it seems to suggest, that if the emails contain winner, there is a significantly higher probability that the email is spam. So in that sense, we're going to be able to use these variables to detect with not great accuracy, unless you're a baseball player and then you're doing tremendous, uh, whether or not an email is spam, simply by asking, does the email contain the data set? contain the word winner in it. So what we're going to do next is figure out how to use the library dplyr to calculate those two proportions for us. And the way we're going to go is just start with your data frame. And then, remember, percent greater than percent is to be read in R as and then. And what we're going to want to do is group by the variable winner. And then, summarize. And what we're going to want to calculate is proportions, p hat 
of the variable span. So we're going to want to estimate proportions, p hat, by taking the mean of the variable span, which consists of ones and zeros. So you can see what we get out are the exact probabilities we have over here. P1 here for emails that do not contain the word winner. The proportion of emails that do not contain the word winner and our spam is 0 0.09, just less than 10% as we see over here. However, if the email does contain the word winner, then it's estimated to be a just above 30% chance that the email is identified as spam. So those are the two proportions, which is super helpful. But in fact, to get R to do the hypothesis test and confidence intervals for us, we're going to need a few more summary statistics. We're going to use the function named little n to calculate our sample size. And so we'll create, whoops, sorry, wrong button. We'll create a new variable named capital N which will give us a new column named capital N with the sample size in each of these scenarios. Further, we're going to calculate another variable named total, which is the count or the sum of the variable spam. But because spam is just ones and zeros, when you add up all the ones and zeros, the ones will essentially be counted, and all the zeros will not. So total here is just the total number of emails that are spam. And again, because we have grouped by winner, you'll get a new column total, named total, that'll have a value of the total number of emails that are spam when the word winner is not contained in those emails. And again, you'll get another value in a new row under the column total. Well, let's just run it and you can see. That'll show you um, 20 emails that contained the word winner are spam. Okay, that's great. Those are the things we're going to need in order to convince R to calculate a hypothesis test and confidence intervals for the difference of these two proportions. So. Let's add this little bit of code just before email to save this new data frame whoops, into a variable named df. You can see by reproducing df down here, we have that data frame indeed. Next, we're going to use the function prop.test. And it takes two arguments. The first argument is going to be that vector total which comes from the data frame df that we just created. And the second argument is the sample sizes. So essentially, this function prop.test will do not only a hypothesis test where the alternative, if you see that in the pop-up that just showed up, where the alternative will be two-sided by default. But you could specify less or greater as you wish. But by default, it'll choose the first in that vector, two-sided which means an alternative hypothesis of not equals to. And simultaneously, it'll calculate a confidence interval for us with a confidence level of 0.95. Again, you could change that argument if you want, but it's good just to leave it at 0.95. So if you run that out, here is your p-value, which if you remember your scientific notation here, this is actually move the decimal point over one and then eight more times. So you get point and then eight zeros and then a five. And that's much smaller than our level of significance, 0 0.05. So indeed, the hypothesis test suggests by rejecting the null hypothesis, when the p-value is low, reject HO. This hypothesis test rejects HO in favor of the alternative that these two proportions are not equal. And indeed, they don't look equal. There seems to be a significant difference between um, emails that contain the word winner being identified as spam or emails that do not contain the word winner being identified as spam. And here is our 95% confidence interval, which, if you notice, is strictly 
less than zero. Now look what's happened here. Here is our estimate with rounding just slightly different, but you can see they round to the same numbers for P1, proportion one. And here is our estimate for P2. And the way our math worked out earlier was we take P1, which is clearly smaller, and we subtract off P2, which is clearly bigger. And because P2 is so much bigger, it push, pushes our confidence interval strictly negative for both of the values, which means zero is somewhere over here, excluding, excluded from our interval. So it turns out this confidence interval being strictly negative suggests that the two proportions are not equal, just the same as the hypothesis test suggests that the two proportions are not equal. And if you pay attention to the size of these proportions, what I like more about confidence intervals is that because these are negative and we know that we went proportion one minus proportion two, the confidence interval tells us or shows us that proportion two is the bigger of the two proportions. That, in my opinion, is better than this p-value, which does not tell us which of the two proportions is bigger by itself. But the confidence interval does, by itself, tell us that we have evidence to suggest that the two proportions are not the same, and further, that proportion two is bigger. Okay, so this was our video talking about the test for the difference of proportions. We have gone over some of the uh, concepts behind the tests um, on pen and paper for both hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. And then here in an example in R, we used the data set we introduced, uh, we used to introduce the concepts between testing the difference of proportions. We learned how to make a very nice plot highlighting the two proportions we're interested in testing. We learned a little bit extra about the library dplyr, which is going to be super helpful for us as this class continues. And then maybe most important of all for you all is we learned that there's in fact one function that will do all the code necessary for both a hypothesis test for the difference in proportions and confidence intervals. And I hope you agree that the code to get to that is not terribly difficult. It does take a little bit of a learning, a learning curve to get over this uh, dplyr syntax, but I remind you that this symbol here should just be read in English as and then. And hopefully with that, this video will enable you to calculate hypothesis tests and difference of proportion confidence intervals.